it's broken. It doesn't work. Well, I have to send it back. It was really cool, too, but when it works. Um, one of the... Uh, Okay, so I know it sounds like a knockoff. It seemed like a knockoff. I know. I know. I, I thought of this before Donald Trump thought Make America Great Again. Do you believe that? You don't, do you? You don't believe that. Okay. Okay, just, just okay, I didn't. So I don't want to be a liar about that. But, but I, I saw this, I, I saw this, this poll by Gallup. And the number of people who think the Bible is the literal word of God is diminishing. And so I made this little video, and let me show it to you. The survey says that only 24% of Americans believe the Bible is to be taken literally. And if you don't realize it, it's an all-time low for our nation. Since 2003, I've devoted my ministry to helping people study through the Bible each year. And it only takes 30 minutes each day on the average. I developed Bible Track. It's a 365-day Bible study plan. That takes you through the entire Bible once each year. BibleTrack.org is free. It features either King James Version or New King James Version, and it's complete with a brief commentary that will give you context and meaning for each passage. I also feature King James Version and New King James Version podcasts for each day, and they feature the reading of the passage and my notes. Hey, I want you to succeed in being able to defend our Bible as the Word of God. Now, a lot of people, well, they get stalled out in the Old Testament. I get it. There's some parts of the Old Testament that are, well, difficult. But almost always, it's because the reader lacks the context. Moreover, many Christians have a difficult time understanding how many Old Testament passages relate to the New Testament Christian life. So here's what I do about that. I provide links between the Testaments. When an Old Testament passage is important to understand in the context of the New Testament, I link to it the page where the New Testament scriptures are found. Likewise, when a New Testament scripture is based upon Old Testament, I explain that and I link it. I studied through the Bible every year since the beginning of 2003, and I've written down pertinent, helpful notes. My goal was to give Christians a simple way to study the Bible without having to have a pile of books on top of your desk. So what I have is a way to do it with just your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Now, if you spend a lot of time in the car, I've recorded 730 podcasts, 365 King James and 365 New King James. You can subscribe to those podcasts on Apple's podcast site. We read the Bible chronologically. We do three days in the Old Testament and one day in the New Testament. Old Testament passages that duplicate events are treated together chronologically as they occurred in time. Likewise, we do the same with the Gospel accounts. Some days reading from all four Gospels when they tell the same stories. It's a great way to read and grasp the content of the Word of God. To help you succeed, you can sign up to receive daily email reminders with links for the readings. I also provide the links to Apple to have the daily podcast well, delivered automatically to your device. Hey, I want to reverse the trend in America. I want to help build a new generation of Christians who study the Bible in context and they don't have to make excuses for the Word of God. Let's make the Word of God revered again. All right, so uh, that is, uh, is on Facebook. And I would much appreciate it if you would, uh, if you would uh, share it so that I can get it out. I, I want, I, I really it's... Um, um, I mean, I knew when I was writing, when I started writing in 2003, in 2004 is when I decided to put everything up on, uh, on the web, uh, I knew that, that much of what I was writing would one day be held with great disdain by Christians. <laughs> I knew that. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I was careful about what I wrote, but accurate so that if 30 years from now they're making fun of the, of the, of the uh, comments that I've made, then they're making fun of what's actually written in the Word of God. And that day is coming, and we'll talk about it a little bit today as we are in the book of Acts. 
In Acts chapter 5, um, quite frankly, it's a passage I love to talk about, but not so much preach about. And, and, and here's the reason. Um, you know, people that don't know our God and don't know our Bible, they really have a disdain for God, but when they describe our God, they try to describe a God that's all loving and all forgiving and overlooks everything and, and, uh, and just, just the God that all he wants is for everybody, except Hitler, to succeed. They just, just want, just, you know, God. And, and, you know, they have that notion because they've never actually read the Old Testament, for sure. And they've never read a lot of the New Testament. You know, the uh, overindulging parent that ends up raising hoodlums and he's getting out of jail for the rest of his life? You know, that's not our God. Our God cares about us. And this passage right here uh, is a little tricky, but I'm going to show you that it's even still another passage that shows us that God cares about us. Now this, um, uh, you know, this funeral. Funeral is just, it's, it's tough when somebody asks you to do a funeral for somebody that you don't know. Now, I only marry people that I have a, a, a relationship with, and church-wise, in some capacity, or the parents. But uh, begrudgingly, I'll do anybody's funeral. And when I say begrudgingly, I've had uh, three occasions where I preached uh, for just outright, nobody had any question about it, lost person. And, uh, and, and you know, if you're going to do that, you need to get one of the, the liberal preachers to preach your funeral, because he'll pray everybody, he'll preach everybody into heaven. Um, uh, I went to a funeral for my friend Grady Baker and his wife before that. Uh, and same preacher preached both funerals, and he said, the lady came up to me and said, uh, Preacher, will we see our loved ones in heaven? And he said, it wouldn't be heaven if we didn't. Well, you know, that, that's, if, if I were writing the Bible, that's probably the way I'd write it. I didn't write the Bible, I just report the Bible. But all your relatives are not going to be in heaven. I'm, I'm sorry, I wish it weren't so. I mean, if I could change it, I would, but I'm, I'm like a, a reporter. Preachers ought to be reporters on what's in the Word of God. Uh, I had a friend, and uh, he was always talking about his mama, how mean she was when she was when they were kids. And, and actually, she stayed mean all through her life, and then she died. And it was kind of a joke with this guy talking about how mean his mama was. So, of course... I went to her funeral, and uh, in the funeral, the pastor gets up, and he preaches out of Proverbs 31. Now, for those of you who don't know, Proverbs 31 is the virtuous woman. I mean, like, like the perfect woman that, that had it all together with her family. She had a home business where she was bringing in stuff. She cared. She supported her husband in every aspect. She was the virtuous woman. That's what we call the virtuous woman. And he's up there and he's describing this mom as the virtuous woman. And I'm, I can't help but, but look over at him every once in a while and see, see what he's thinking about all this, you know. This was, by the way, her pastor that was preaching the message. I'm going, well, I guess at a funeral, all bets are off. You got to make everybody, everybody just, just, you know, just great. So the church of Jerusalem grew to thousands after just a few short weeks. And in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, we're told that the early church in Jerusalem shared everything. That was last week's message, shared everything. Now that's uh, because, and as we talked about last week, we they thought when Jesus left, they said, you're going to establish the kingdom now? And he says, not for you to know the time of the season, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Be witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth. So I'm sure those people thought, okay, he told us, when we get this done, then the kingdom. So they were pumped. They were sharing everything. It was communal. 
It says in that passage that we looked at last week that no one considered anything they had their own. They just shared everything. And so then at the end of last week's message, we saw this guy, Joseph, who became Barnabas, uh, Paul's sidekick in the first missionary journey. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement or exhortation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So people are looking and saying, hey, you know, Joseph, he is the man. I mean, he, woo! I mean, people had to be saying, you mean he sold and he brought everything and laid it down at the apostles' feet? That was big doings. Okay, so, um, so let's meet Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, different kind of a, a people that don't want to be seen. There they are. Let's meet Ananias and Sapphira. So Ananias and Sapphira... They are a couple who, when they saw Joseph getting all of this praise, you know, all the people standing around, oh, he turned all this, whoa, and they're saying, ah, you know, well, I get a piece of that. Come on, come on. Now, I'm, okay, maybe I'm a little guessing here, but she's saying, come on, Ananias, we can do that. We can get a piece of that action. Come on, we can get some recognition. Come on, let's do this. Come on. Ananias is probably saying, whatever you say, dear. <laughs> and so after they see that, they get this idea, let's do that too. So that's where we take up with chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it to the apostles' feet. Now, by the way, a very generous, very generous donation there. I'm sure, very generous donation. It was enough, as a matter of fact, that it could have very well, people probably thought, well, yeah, that's the entire proceeds from the property, just like Joseph did. And so I can imagine people were cheering, yay, Ananias and Sapphire, you are, well, he comes in by himself at first. And they're saying, well, that is such a generous gesture. But you don't know the rest of the story yet. Did you see where the CBS News, the CBS Network, Federal Employees Union, for the last 20 years, the manager of the credit union has been embezzling $40 million dollars? To the point where they had to liquidate it and turn it over, turn the assets over to another credit union because they're busted. So everybody thought, what a man. He's, he's, he is doing such a good job with our credit union. Then it turns out that he had pocketed $40 million. Now here's the problem. This church is new. The first time they ever actually got a glimpse of the Holy Spirit was on the day of Pentecost. They don't quite know what to think about this because under the old system, you only had to get away with it with the Pharisees and with the Sadducees and the priests. You, you only had to get away with it with them. And they're, they're not mind readers. They can't know supernatural stuff. And so, so naturally, naturally, you, you, uh, you don't think you have to take any excessive precautions. You, you don't think you've got to necessarily put a piece of tape over the over the camera on your computer. You don't think you got to do anything like that. You, you know, you're not taking extra precautions because you don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit. But then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Whoa. And keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. He says, um, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but God. So, um, this is new. How did he know? How did he find all this out? 
Well, Peter says right there at the beginning, Holy Spirit. Now, uh, you know, people are doing things all the time that are just only not really wrong. You know, I mean, as, as a matter of fact, where's the line? If a rich guy buys a wing for a college, then naturally the college lets his son in, right? There's nothing, there's nothing sinister, illegal about that. But if you, uh, if you pay somebody to fake your picture on the team, and you can't even play that sport, you can go to jail for that, and all the people that helped you. So, you know, life is kind of shades of gray, and depending on your upbringing, you know, different shades of gray. I talked to with uh, someone recently, and they were talking about a uh, person they were dating. They said, you know, I'm just not feeling so good about this because he seems to have a different understanding of right and wrong than I do. And I, and I just, and we've talked, and, and, and he agrees, but I, I'm, just not, I'm just not feeling comfortable here. And so it stopped being a relationship because... The shades of gray. We all have different shades of gray. I mean, I mean, when everybody, when when we, uh, I just learned this the other day. Now you probably already knew this. Um, servers. Uh, if you put it on your credit card, then it shows up on their W two as tips. If you lay the dollar bills on the table. Almost always, it doesn't show up anywhere. Yes. Now, uh, uh, my my uncle uh, was um, auditor for the Internal Revenue Service in Kentucky. Made my stepmom paranoid. She uh, did some sewing for somebody, and they gave her thirty dollars. And she said, "I just need to make sure I get that on the taxes because I'm betting he's looking at our stuff." He's looking at our stuff, and he's going to know. Um, turns out that's illegal, but that didn't usually stop them. But, but anyway, a, a lot of people do things, you know, like in, in secret, that they don't really think is all that wrong. For instance, the other day, um, I ordered a big button phone from my dad. I mean, buttons are that big because he can't see well, so he got macular degeneration. And... Uh, so it was out for delivery, Amazon's delivery group, and it almost got to his house, and then I got a flag that says, refused by the, by the recipient, and it went away. So I got on the phone, I called Amazon, and he said, oh, we're sorry, we're going to work this out. And uh, so he got a, uh, he said, but it's already back to the, going back to the warehouse, nothing we can do about that, one, so we'll just get another one, and I'll try to get it to you as soon as I can. And so I uh, ordered another one. Well... Make a long story short, it came the next day, but then I kept noticing that there was a phone out for delivery, and I thought, oh, they're about to deliver the other phone. So I stopped Amazon, I said, take it back. Well, I got one phone, charged for the phone, and refunded for the phone that I didn't get. So then I had an extra $28. Now, I'm thinking, you know, I could just let it go. I thought, it's going to be a pain. It's going to be a pain trying to give Amazon money back. <laughs> but I found it's not nearly as hard to give them money back as it is to get your money back. So, so they took it. But you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, we're all the time in, in situations where uh, w what I hate is when is when fast food people give you food. It's not their food to give you. But you don't want to say something in front of the manager and get them in trouble. You know, they're trying to be nice to you. And, and uh, so we're all facing all kinds of, of situations that are just kind of gray and you don't know exactly what to do about them. Well, I'm sure in Ananias and Sapphire's mind, they thought he would get all the credit here and this is not a big deal. Look how much we're given. It doesn't matter that we're keeping part of it back. And really, it didn't matter that they were keeping part of it back. As long as they didn't say, this is everything. They know who they were dealing with. So, what happens next is where I'm always feeling like I need to, I need to defend God. You know, like he needs me to defend him. 
because uh, well, I'm struggling today and thing keeps going away. The self-praise was the problem. And he says, you've not lied to, to men, but you've lied to God. Now, Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. <laughs> Duh. And the young men rose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Luke, we'd like to have more on this. We, we want, we want, give us something. Just give us something because, because, here's what I want to know. How can I avoid dying in church? Think about it. Because we're, we're, we're not told why, why. I mean, okay, so he told a lie. He gave this huge gift, but in the process told a lie. Then he drops dead. You know, what are the dynamics here? I mean, I mean, well, what is this? Well, what's the underworking, Luke? Tell us, what's the underworking here that caused this to happen? I mean, until they find out what is behind the 737 Max crashes, they don't fly them anymore. Well, at this point, I'm thinking, I'm not going back to that church <laughs> until they figure out what happened here. So, now here's, here's where people really really um, show they don't understand God at all. Most people look at that and they make an assumption that Ananias and Sapphira were lost people. I'm going to tell you, that right there proves that they were saved people. And it's called chastisement. For whom the Lord loves, Hebrews 12, 6, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Hebrews 12, 8. But if you're without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you illegitimate and not sons. You have no standing with God if you don't have chastisement. You have no standing with your neighbor because he doesn't come over, even when I was a kid, my neighbor didn't come over and spank me. He didn't have the standing to do that. Well, because Ananias and Sapphira had a standing with God, then for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Now, there was more to it than that. The power of the Holy Spirit was demonstrated this very day so that people were going, mm, okay, I... I I can't mark that down on my list. Number one, do not lie to the Holy Spirit because whatever that is, it's not a good thing. So they were saved, no question. Now it was about three hours. This is where it just gets too bizarre. I mean, where's a cell phone when you need it? You know? It was about three hours later when it. You notice after Ananias dropped dead, the men just came in, wrapped him up, and took him out and buried him? What a cold bunch of people, huh? <laughs> so three hours later, I guess death is funny if it happened 2,000 years ago to people that you don't know. I, guess. I don't know. Sorry. I meant to try to be serious, but I just can on this story. It's about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and apparently she came in separately because, hey, Anna, I, I don't want to share all the accolades with you. I want to come in and get my own accolades. Yay, Sapphira, you are the lady. You are, yeah. And so she walks in having no idea what had happened because news back then traveled very slowly. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, I did. That was exactly how much. How many say it was? Yep, that was it. That's, that's how much exactly. Now, it's really simple here. Don't lie. It's, it, but she gives the killer answer. <laughs> Pun intended. She gives the killer answer. Yes, that's exactly what we sold it for. 
And then Peter replies, How is it that you have agreed to test the Spirit of the Lord? Notice a double underline under test the Spirit of the Lord. <laughs> what a phrase. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. She's going, what? Then immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last, and the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Because they had the money to pay for the plot. How is it you have agreed together to test the, what is that test? The, the Greek word is perazo. And, and actually it's, uh, it's, it's to take something and, and, and put it to the proof. Um, being a Jew, as all of them were before they got saved, and they're still practicing Judaism as well as practicing Christians, all the church wars back in the beginning. That's why it's not healthy to try to pattern our New Testament churches full of Gentiles to the early church, which was full of Jews, until we get over to Paul's first missionary journey. So it's, it's not a good thing. And there's a lot of, so much dissimilar stuff that it's not a good thing. Um, you validate everything you see in Acts as a pattern by New Testament epistles, letters that validate it. So... Um, being a Jew, a violation, a violation meant that a Sadducee or somebody was going to catch you and report you. But this was just different to everybody. And, uh, you know, it's just like, it's, you think you're getting away with it? But Peter calls it testing the Spirit of the Lord, perazzo, testing. Putting it to the proof. You know, you get a car, what you do? Well, women don't do the same thing men do. Uh, you get a car, and you want to know how fast does it accelerate. I mean, I do that when I'm before I buy the car. You know, you get out on the highway, you tromp it to the floor, and you see how fast, how long it takes to get to 60 miles an hour. Uh, women don't do that. Oh, they do? <laughs> hey, Ben. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you, you know, you're testing it. You, you, you want to know, you want to know exactly what, what makes this thing go. It's to put to the test. Um, you, you want to know, you want to test the gas mileage. You, yeah, I'm particularly interested in the turning ratio. When I go to the gym, I like that first space that's pointing out to the road because of smash and grab. You know what smash and grab is? You know, and I want the people at the front desk watching my car. So I, I pull around and... And the green van that I drove before this, I, I'd pull around and I couldn't make that first place. I'd have to back up and pull back in. So first thing I do with my little car is I pull around. Yeah. Love it. Good turning ratio. So we know what it's like to put, uh, what it's like to put things to the test, don't we? we? We understand proving things. Well, law versus grace. They'd been under law, and now here's grace. What's grace like? Well, grace has got this supernatural component to it that law didn't have. And this supernatural component says, you're not accountable to men anymore. You're accountable to Jesus and God through the Holy Spirit's empowerment in your life. And the Holy Spirit reads mine. And communicates not just your words, but your thoughts to God. Well, for them, that's, that's such a new concept. He's saying, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I've been preaching about this. You saw what happened on the day of Pentecost. Uh, what made you think that it was a good idea to test the Holy Spirit? I mean, start with smaller tests, not death sentences. <laughs> You know, men judge and get it wrong. The Holy Spirit never gets it wrong. What kind of God does this, though? That's what people think. God, what? what? God killed somebody? No. God doesn't kill people. Again, read with me in the Old Testament, and thou wilt see. 
A lot of dead people in the Old Testament. He said, well, God didn't kill them. Yes, God killed them. Says so. Old Testament, God killed them. Yeah, but God doesn't kill anybody in the New Testament. Yes, he does. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep at the church court. Sleep dead. Yes. What kind of a God does that? Well, listen. I always felt like I said, yeah, but you know, and I don't know. Listen. God's God. It's not up to him to change his mode of operation for us. It's up to us to change our mode of operation for him. Because God is God and I have no ability whatsoever to change that. So, we come to the word of God. Uh, which my new campaign is let's let the campaign let's let the word of God be revered again let's make the word of God revered again because it's not anymore and the reason it's not is because preachers everywhere are skipping over the tough stuff and they are not wanting to be offensive and there are a host of preachers that don't care what the word of God says about anything but there are another big bunch of preachers who care, but they think it's best just to avoid the controversial stuff. I mean, why do the controversial stuff? And listen, I don't go out of my way to do the controversial stuff. But when you do textual preaching, as opposed to topical preaching, then textual preaching, I'm looking at these first 11 verses in Acts chapter 5, and I know it looks like I'm having fun talking about those verses. But... I always would prefer to just not deal with those verses. Not have to explain what the circumstances are where God might take someone's life. Because for most of the world, they're out there saying, oh, no, not a loving God. You know, the big prize? Eternity with God. And what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Here was the situation. At the church of Corinth, they had made a mockery out of communion. And what he said, they actually were having something akin to the love feast that the pagans did in the name of, and they ate this big meal and and everybody didn't have food. And so Paul apparently had warned them, but they said, no, we're having so much fun doing it this way, we're not changing. So Paul then says, Um, he says, uh, for he that eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks damnation to himself, and here was the unworthy part, not discerning the Lord's body. They weren't eating the Lord's Supper in respect to it being the Lord's Supper. They were partying on the Lord's Supper. And he says, for this cause, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged first Corinthians 11 31 then listen to this part but when we are judged by whom by the Lord when we are judged we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world so here's the deal as hard as it is to absorb once you receive Jesus Christ your personal Savior There's a new boss, and the boss is the Holy Spirit. The boss of you is the Holy Spirit. Communicates directly to you from God. And the Holy Spirit urges you to do this and not to do this. James 4, 17, to him who knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin. So there's a new standard for sin as opposed to the Old Testament. Things aren't sins in themselves. They are sins when the Holy Spirit convicts you and says, don't do that, don't don't do that. And you still might make a mistake, but God's really, really forgiving on mistakes. Don't let, don't let people take you to the Old Testament and say, no, God smack you down. No, he won't. No, God's very forgiving. He is long-suffering. We're told over and over by Paul that he's long-suffering. But when you cross that line, I don't know where the line is. I don't want to find the line. I don't even get close to the line. You know, when, when I'm up and there's a ledge and it's down there, I'm five feet behind the fence. You don't have to tell me not to lean on that. I'm not getting near the fence. And I'm not getting near that line, whatever it is, where God says, all right, you went too far. I'm not getting near that line. So, here it is. 
metaphorically. When you know that it is good and don't do it, James 4, 17, and you shake your fist in God's face and say, I'm not changing. Hang on. You might have the sudden death syndrome. Now, I actually know people that I am absolutely convinced God killed them because they were saved, but they refused to follow and God took their lives. Now you hear that and you say, well, why would I want to get saved and serve your God? Well, it's better than going to hell. What can I say? What can I say? I mean, you've been around people that are permissive parents, right? And you don't hang with them so much because their kids drive you crazy. And all the way home, he said, I tell you, this is my child. I tell you, I do. I tell you, I tell you, I do. You know, you have that conversation all the way home. Well, well, God's not that permissive God. No, no, God, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit wants us to comply with God's will. And Ananias and Sapphira just thought they were going to, they are going to pull it over, you know. When I landed in boot camp, in 1967, August of 67, um, I learned after just a few moments that my suggestions or my better ideas <laughs> would go nowhere. When you get saved, here's the thing. These are God's rules. And me as a preacher... How irresponsible would I be if I try to cover up some of God's rules that seem just harsh and hard to understand? I'd be irresponsible. I don't want to be irresponsible. God's a righteous judge. He knows our motivation for everything. God is God no matter what we think. He's still God. So fear. Yeah. Fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. That word fear is phobos. Um, phobos, or phobia, is the uh, uh, neuter gender form, phobia. And, and we have phobia a lot in our English language. Don't we? We, have, um, we have claustrophobia, uh, which is what Brad thinks about our little practicing room right there. And then we go in there... And we did it to keep from interrupting. Did it work, by the way? Did it work pretty good? We, we practiced, we screamed, we did it, it so that, you know, we wouldn't... Mary's idea, Mary's idea. So, way to go, Mary. And then there's uh, agoraphobia. I'm afraid of uh, agora's marketplace, you know, in public. Um, uh, afraid of being in public places. Um, acrophobia, fear of high places. I am acrophobic. Um, I own an arachnophobia. I am really arachnophobia. Because spiders, I don't care how small they are. They can hurt you. And so I'm scared of spiders. All of these phobias have abnormal or disorder in the word. Fear of these things irrationally. But then we come down to one, and, and I'm sorry, I just can't help but homophobia, like we're scared, when we're not, not scared, we, we, just, we just don't feel like that they ought to be able to change our value system. We just, we're not asking, we're not asking for any more than they were asking for, let us be us, and now we're being pressured from all sides, so we're not scared, we just don't like the fact that we feel like we are under attack if we don't bend what the Word of God teaches. And so I really resent homophobia. Here's what I do. I want to stay in favor with God. Now, there are a lot of churches that preach the message, and, and I did back in the early days. The notion was that you preach to the congregation and you make them feel that no matter how hard you're working, how much you're doing, it's not enough. 
work harder. And you always just try to cast this net of guilt over the congregation. And get them coming down and saying, oh, I haven't been living right and I got saved, but I'm not doing good. They prayed for me. And, and when I was a teenager, there's this one girl that got rededicated her life like every month. And I'm thinking, well, what's she into? <laughs> I mean, I really did. I thought, man, she must be a whore. I knew her sister. And I kind of handed around. I said, what's your sister? But, but, uh, uh, but, but, you know, at that time, we had kind of a fiery guy. And he, he was always making you think that you didn't do something right. You know, I want to I stay in favor with God. And the only thing I have to do to stay in favor with God is just don't shake my fist metaphorically in God's face and say, I'm not going to do it. I can make all kinds of mistakes and God will overlook them because He's a loving, long-suffering God. But I just can't look at God and say, I ain't doing it. That's just not permissible. So they had great fear. Great fear came upon all the church, upon all who heard these things. Phobias are natural. This one was really natural. The God of the Bible is unchangeable. Get to know him. It's important. Let's stand, please.